Good morning. Thank you for joining a COVID-19 employer update Zoom call featuring Randy Zook and Dr. Joe Thompson. Before Randy kicks off uh, our call today, I want to remind you of a couple of things. So first of all, just wanted to remind you that you're all muted. If you have questions, and we hope that you do, please submit them in the chat box. If you're on a desktop, that chat feature can be found at the bottom of your screen. If you're on a mobile device, just tap participants and then chat, and that box should open up for you. And with that, Randy will get us started. Thank you, Sandra, and good morning, everybody. I'm Randy Zook with the Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce and Associated Industries of Arkansas. I think this is the fourth episode of the Joe Thompson Show. That's I what I'm about. It feels like we've been here a while. <laughs> it, it, it does, but uh, that aside, uh, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Joe Thompson, our good friend, is uh, president and CEO of the Arkansas Center for uh, health care improvement and also a professor of medicine at the medical center so he knows whereof he speaks he's giving us a, a more informed and deeper dive each week into the state of the pandemic in arkansas and uh, hopefully will help us begin to see uh, some sort of path back to some level of normalcy as we move along and with that i'm going to pitch it over to Joe Thompson and look forward to his remarks. Randy, thank you for having and, and for your viewers. I look forward to engaging in conversations after we run through a, through, through a few updates. You know, I do think as a nation, we're starting to see some of the plateau that we've been anticipating. It's not even across the United States. Uh, uh, here is the most recent kind of updates with now over 30,000 deaths. Uh, importantly, I think for us and our region, Louisiana has now emerged as a hot point. Uh, there are 21, to almost 22,000 reported cases and over 1,100 deaths just wow. in our, in our uh, southern sister state uh, below us. Uh, New York continues to be the epicenter, although I think the, the mayor there and the governor are starting to at least see some uh, breathing room. Uh, again, Detroit continues to be a major issue, as does southern uh, uh, Florida. Uh, but, you know, this is now uh, 600,000 plus cases, 30,000 plus deaths. Uh, we're in the middle of it. We're not at the end of it. Um, uh, we may be at the end of the beginning so that we can actually kind of see things going forward. We're also having this issue in Arkansas uh, where we now have, you know, almost 1,600 confirmed cases. Currently we have 83 people hospitalized, 26 of those on ventilators. And our death toll, while not the magnitude that we're seeing in other parts of the nation, uh, continues to step up each day. Or, uh, and, and the health department is reporting individuals that have recovered from this. And I think that's the positive news here. Those that they knew were sick are recovering. Again, many people are asymptomatically infected and never have the symptoms. So the right. number there of people who have been infected and, and uh, gotten past this are, is probably much, much higher. You see the concentration uh, there in the darkest blue counties. Uh, it's population related, but it's also, you're starting to see almost every county have active infection uh, in their uh, ge geographic areas. If we go to the next slide, uh, we've got, you know, this is again, we, we are doing a good job. I want to commend, you know, your membership, uh, the communities in which they are having their workers uh, stay put, the community leaders in, in all our Kansans. We are flattening this curve. Um, the current projections by the Seattle group does not suggest that we're going to over, overwhelm uh, our hospital system or need more ventilators than we have or need That's more ICU beds. And so I think really good we can't declare victory, but we're ahead on the scoreboard. Right. Uh, and you know, I think this is an important step. You know, when we look at the number of cases as, as they move forward, on the next slide, you know, we continue to be on this upward trajectory. We are not you know, over the hump yet, uh, although that that slope, I think, is much, much less steep than it would have been if we hadn't taken all the measures that, that individuals and our leadership is suggesting that we continue to uh, exercise across the state. These are the total number of confirmed cases at right around 1,600. Uh, the next slide are, is the uh, new cases each day, and you can see we're hanging right around 70 to 80 new cases every day that are presenting with symptoms or being tested and positive. Uh, you see the spike there of 130. That was uh, over the weekend with the uh, uh, federal correction facility number cases and the Cummins cases being added Saturday and Sunday with about 70 folks there uh, under both of those. But right around 80, 75 to 80 every day of new cases identified. Of course, what we want to see is this curve 
start to go down. We'd, we'd like to see the left side of the curve over on the right side of the graph. Right. Uh, and we'll get there. But I think right now, you know, our, our healthcare system is able to manage this number of new cases. Um, obviously, individuals would like to avoid becoming a case, uh, but, but I think we're doing well on the new cases per day. What would be real progress? Below 60 consistently? You know, I, I think progress, I think success, is if we can hold this number below 100 each day. If we can stay at 100 a day of new cases, then you we're not going to stretch it. our capacity. We're going to be able to deliver those services. Obviously, you know, if you look over the last two weeks, we've inched up. So mm -hmm. I think success is going to be not to have that continue to go above 100. And over time, we're going to see it starting to inch back down. Yep. Uh, but I think we're a few weeks away from that probably. <clears throat> Uh, if we go to the next slide, these are the uh, hospitalizations per day, and this is, Randy, what I think, you know, you're seeing needed care being delivered across the state, and all right. of these cases are not at UAMS, they're, they're in hospitals, Northwest Arkansas, Northeast Arkansas, um, Pine Bluff, uh, Southern Arkansas, these are the current hospitalizations, and, and again, this is a manageable number, we'd like for it to be lower, but this is manageable for our health and health care system. Uh, on the next slide, um, you know, this continues to be a condition. Uh, Secretary Smith puts out the absolute numbers each day, and the number of those between 19 to 64 is larger. But when you denominate it by the population, how many people we have that are over age 65, this continues to be an older individual's greatest threat. Uh, and I think we're seeing that on individuals that are hospitalized, those with the conditions of lung problems or diabetes, right. other issues, are having a tougher time uh, with this condition. Go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, I want to do just a little bit because it's out in the news now. You're starting to hear about We're different kind of tests. Well, you're, I'm, I'm not going to make you an immunologist, but I'm going to try to give you at least some of the catch words to listen for. Good. Um, you hear about testing. Um, testing has been a challenge, still is a challenge. We have right. limited tests. People that want a test can't just go get one. The health department is loosening that up a little bit as tests are more readily available. Good. The test that tells you if you are actively infected now is called a PCR, or polymerase chain reaction test. It's actually looking for pieces of the virus in your saliva, in your uh, nasal pharynx, in your, in your oropharynx. You know, that is the PCR test that gives you, are you infected today? But you're starting to hear about tests, about immun immunoglobulin tests. The Major League Baseball team is gonna have their IgG. Okay. Their, Ig immunoglobulin G tested. What is what is that about? Well, we've talked before. Our our bodies have never seen this virus before. So right. when we get infected, our immune system doesn't know to mount a response. That's why we have asymptomatic folks, and we have that 14-day quarantine period. Right. But when our body recognizes it, it starts making all sorts of cytokines, and our white blood cells get revved up. And you hear about people that have recovered donating their plasma so that sick folks can get that plasma. So that's kind of a passive immunity transfer. Somebody okay. who's recovered, you give them all that good juice in the plasma to help somebody that's the same blood type receive that plasma and have a better chance of recovering. How, how often, just a quick side note, sure. how often can you donate if you're a recovered person? How often can you I have don't know, plasma? we'll get the answer there. It's more often than you can donate your blood, right. your red blood cells. Red blood cells take a longer time to generate. Yep. Uh, your plasma, it's a shorter time frame that you can donate there. We'll try to get that answer before we're back next week. Um, so that's the plasma donation, but over time your body starts to mount it says, okay, I know I've had a threat. I'm going to build an antibody, an immunoglobulin, mm -hmm. and IgG antibodies are those that last for a long time. So that's when you're hearing people talk about getting their IgG test to see if they've been infected and if they have immunity to keep them from becoming reinfected. Okay. What we do not know is whether that IgG lasts the rest of your lifetime or whether for some reason that IgG is gonna wane and we're gonna have a potential recurrence next year. So those are the two big tests. Absent of vaccine. Absent of vaccine. The polymerase chain reaction is to test for the virus itself. Mm -hmm. The IgG is to test your immune system to see if it's mounted a response that offers you some protection into the future. Good. Now you mentioned a vaccine. If we can go to the next slide. You know, this is actually trying to build a tool to show your immune system what the virus looks like before you get the virus so that it will mount a response and you'll have some of that IgG without getting the virus itself. You'll see at the top here the traditional program, uh, you know, you would identify the target, uh, the threat, in this case COVID-19. You'd develop, you know, what you wanted to attack it. Phase one would be some safety trials to make sure the vaccine was not going to cause harm. Mm -hmm. Phase two would be 
efficacy trials to make sure it did work against the, the uh, virus that you're trying to protect against. And then phase three is how long does it last? You don't want to just give a vaccine that's only good for two weeks right. and then have it, you know, not falsely give you a sense of protection over time. What's happening now is the FDA is really accelerating this timeline. The, the timeline at the top could take years sometimes to develop. So they're accelerating, they're compressing some of those phase trials. I think right now they're nation or worldwide, there are about 50 vaccine development efforts underway. Three of those, I believe, are in that first phase of safety trials. So I think, you know, the vaccine community is accelerating their effort. And I think within, you know, eight to 10 months, we could have something here to offer individuals that have not been infected and that have not developed any, you know, resistance themselves to the vaccine. Eight to 10 months forward. would be by the end of this calendar year, uh, rough, roughly. Uh, roughly, I think, you know, some of this, some of this depends <clears throat> on the safety trial. If, right. if, if you have a trial that fails because it wasn't up. safe, then you're going back a little bit. So these all trials, of these, all these steps go in stages. And these so, are not cheap either. Are they? They're not cheap. And, and, you know, I think you're seeing the, you know, the creative, innovative, you know, health care, pharmacy, pharmaceutical industry of the mm -hmm. world kind of coming to the front uh, to make differences. The winner will be a winner. The winner will, uh, the, the top two or three are going to be uh, uh, yes. investment opportunities. Uh, that would be right. <laughs> if we can go to the next trial, the other thing that's happening, uh, and you saw some of it this week in the, in the governor's release, the CARES Act, okay. which Congress passed a couple of weeks ago, is now starting to flow funds to our health care system. Uh, last Friday, they made the first contribution of 30, 300 million dollars. It's hard to even say that. I understand. Uh, it's in the nick of time, <laughs> in many cases. Two hospitals uh, based upon their Medicare, you know, coverage mm -hmm. uh, that helped most Arkansas hospitals. Yeah. Uh, you know, Excellent. there are hospitals that don't treat Medicare patients, like Arkansas Children's Hospital, that I think right. are looking forward to uh, potentially having some some safeguards put in place uh, in future funding opportunities. But this is starting to flow. Uh, we are in need of this because our hospitals are, you know, important, you know, economic engines in our community, and they're, no they, are, they are hurting right now across, the, across the state. Some of these hospitals are the largest payroll in the whole area right. of the state. Right. No question about it. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, um, you know, this is interesting. We put this up a couple, three weeks ago, and some of the studies are coming out now. Uh, if you lose your smell and your taste, you probably are infected with COVID-19. It's rare to lose your smell and taste. That's a good answer. But some of the though. studies that are coming out now, if we can have the bullets on here, you know, is, is people are losing their sense of smell or their sense of taste when they have this condition. Uh, about 85% of people who lose their sense of smell have COVID-19. Okay. So I, I think wow. for folks uh, you know, in, out there that feel fine, but suddenly, the, the Dr. Pepper or the Coca-Cola doesn't taste the same or, you know, the, the orange isn't bitter or sour. Uh, that might know, need to be a headline. That could, <laughs> that, that could be an early warning sign, and, and I would just encourage folks to, to be cognizant of that. Also, yeah. headache, fever, the dry cough, those continue to be symptoms mm -hmm. uh, of this condition. I think that's what we have as far as kind of new information today. If I go to the next slide, yeah, we're still having our newsletter out there, doing it a couple of times a week. Many Great. of your members have signed up, and we'd encourage you to spread that as far and wide as you'd like to. This is really good information. Look forward to being here as long as we need to be here and answering questions as, as your members have it. Let me tee up one. Uh, how can businesses plan to return to more normal work conditions? What would be best practices in terms of building customer confidence sure. and, and, the, and employee confidence about going back to work. Well, I, I think, you know, and again, your, your membership, the businesses across the state are, are, are widely varied and, and have different, but just to break them down, those businesses that have continued to be open and that have started to put practices in place, mm -hmm. it's not going to be time to take those practices off. No. Uh, I mean, the social distancing, you know, the, the um, spacing of work sites, the cleaning efforts, the emphasis on personal individual hygiene, you know, those will need to continue. It's, it's easy to say, okay, we're, we're, we're not seeing the threat, but it's still out there. And so we've got to continue those. For your businesses that have been relatively closed and haven't really thought about it, I think they can learn from your other members that have been out there. I mean, Absolutely. common sense things of, you know, signage about washing your hands, you know, thinking about spacing, 
Uh, I know at the Research Institute at Children's Hospital, they're, they're looking at some shift work so that they have, you know, not as many people in the labs at the mm -hmm. same time uh, so that they can still get the work done, but, but have, you know, shifts, which yep. is a imposition, Saturday work, work days so that you unbundle some of the um, uh, work week. There's going to be some inconvenience. There already is. Uh, when you say back to normal, I think we're going to be back to a new normal. Exactly. I, I think it's not going to be back to the way it was before. And I think your membership, all of us, are going to have to you know, really think about logically how do we continue to protect ourselves. Right. Uh, Masks notwithstanding. So That's right. So how will we know once we go back to work that things are continuing to be safe? Does this imply some level of testing that's more specific to a sure. business or sure. whatever? Well, as we've talked about over the last few weeks, this is, a, this is a new virus that our bodies have not seen before. Some of us have been exposed and, and probably mounted an immunologic response that we're safeguarded by. Others mm -hmm. have been sick and they've recovered and they have an immunologic response. Uh, I think we're going to need to continue to have you know, the protection efforts in place, uh, but we'll loosen back up. You and I will be able to have, you know, a beer at a local bar here by the middle of summer, uh, yeah. out, outdoors maybe. Yeah. Uh, but, but you know, things are going to be less threatening. I think the thing to watch for and the thing that we shared earlier, that hospitalization number, as long mm -hmm. as we can hold that steady and we can provide high quality, very effective care for our patients as we develop some of these treatment options, right. the plasma, you know, there are medications that are now being tested that I think within a short period of time, weeks, we're going to have guidance on which medicines appear to work. Terrific. You know, as we get those things in place, people's fear of, you know, having a major loss because of this virus, I think will go down. We'll still need to be on guard, but I think over time, we'll get back to a normal that, that feels good. Is it too much to hope for that maybe this will motivate some people to make some better health care choices? Well, I, I think... <laughs> <laughs> it's a loaded question. It is. <laughs> uh, you know, I think for the first time in my lifetime, as a nation, we have all faced a health threat that causes us to think about our own right. health and our health care system in a different way. Right. You know, 9-11 was a focused threat in New York City and Washington, D.C. It mm -hmm. scared all of us, but it only affected those cities directly in terms of the immediate response and then the health effects of, you know, the cleanup afterwards and so forth. This is a health threat that threatened the entire nation, all of our businesses, all of our families, all of our community leaders. I think it will cause us to think about our own personal health differently, and I would expect that we have demands and expectations of not only the healthcare system differently, but how our communities help us stay healthy so that if we have another threat like this, our bodies are more prepared to fend it off. Absolutely. One of the things you meant, touched on it a minute ago about some of our health care providers, especially some of the regional hospitals, I think one headline of this whole episode has been realizing how thin the margins are in operating those facilities and how vulnerable they are to a loss of business or revenue. So what, what are some of the things that we might think about to help make that system more robust? Well, I think, you know, before COVID-19 hit, you know, and for years, we have seen healthcare costs rise, mm -hmm. and we've seen pressure to try to contain those costs be put in place through different mechanisms. So as the costs go up and the revenue comes down, the margin gets thin. I mean, it's not much more complicated than That's that. It's a rock and a hard place. Right <laughs> so, so I think we went into this uh, with, with our healthcare system, particularly some of our rural hospitals, on, on pretty thin ice uh, mm -hmm. in terms of their margin. Uh, I think this is going to cause us to have to, to rethink how we deliver health care. People are getting care now through their telephone, through telemedicine services, even over their computer. Right. And I think people are going to say, that wasn't so bad. Let me continue to do that. I think this will be an opportunity for us to think about how we redesign our health care system. We will need to redesign the financing component of that. And we yes. may want to put some systems in place that cause us not to be as much at risk on thin margin operations of some of our local healthcare facilities. My last question, Joe, is this whole process has certainly accelerated the, the whole trend of working from home. What do you think, what kind of policies should businesses be thinking about where they're sure. asking or encouraging people to work from home? Is there anything they should be aware of? Well, let me, let me start first as, as an employer with 45 people that are there working from home. Yeah. 
some of, some of my folks are loving it and some of them are hating it. And it pretty much depends on whether they are kind of a, a socially it's not extroverted a person. Thing. No, it's, and, and I would also say in large part because of the environment, people are maximally stressed. Their families are stressed, yep. their loved ones are stressed. You know, they're stressed about getting the work done. I mean, so, so I think when we get through this, there will be an opportunity to reassess and say, what did work well and what did we lose by working from home? Um, I think many of our employers have had to rethink some of their you know, work from home strategies, mm -hmm. uh, some of the uh, benefit issues we may want to revisit around you know, sick care, vacation care, you know, uh, shift work. Yep. Um, you know, I think this will cause almost every business and industry to think about, okay, we were forced into a crisis what about that crisis can we learn from so that we can bring it back and actually have a positive contribution to our future you know, work style, productivity, uh, and, and candidly, uh, enjoyment of, of, of folks' lives? I think the A sector that has been dramatically affected and eyes opened is education, right. all the way from K through college. Uh, Post secondary, you know. You know, I, I know our educators. My my brother is a, is a teacher here in the in the Pulaski County District. They're trying. You yeah. know, the students are trying, yep. but this is not the same as being in classroom where you can help somebody work through a complex math problem or, or, right. or teach a you know a, a science uh, um, exercise. And you know, I do worry that some of our youth that that don't have the resources from their parents or their families, that they're losing time and maybe even losing skills as, as this drags on. And, sure. and we're gonna need to find some ways, whether that's through our local libraries and, and reading programs through the summer, you know, when we get through this, right. or, or really tangible options to give parents to say, here's, here's how you can work through a science right. you know, section with your student this summer as a way to keep them caught up. Well, that wraps up my questions. Sandra, anything from the audience at this point? Or have we, we done do such not. a stellar job that there aren't any questions? <laughs> uh, there are no questions yet, but if you would like to submit one, please do right now, um, and we can read that um, and get that answered for you. I also think um, Dr. Thompson was definitely talking about me as one of his employees who does not love working from home. Neither do I. I in fact, <laughs> It's been tough. Randy, let me, one thing that happened this week, this. The governor announced yesterday the Medicaid waiver that will provide right. some supplemental funds for those individuals that are working in our nursing homes and our, our mm -hmm. community-based services for long-term services and support. That was a big deal, and I think you know the the team deserves a lot of credit for thinking early, getting a qu request in place, and right. now being able to deliver effectively hazard pay right. for our healthcare workers in those facilities. And Hard I, earned I, and well deserved. And I think the CARES Act is going to try to do some of the same thing on the hospital side. You know, I, I am proud of our of our state for what it's been able to do. I know mm -hmm. we continue nationally to be one of those states that is not got a shelter in place, you know, Taking color. Uh, but I think if you look at the data that, that is coming out, I don't want to be prematurely, you know, across the finish line, but I think we're doing as well as we can be doing, and, and I'm optimistic on, on where we're going. I think the governor's approach has just been spot on, and he's finally getting some even from Dr. Fauci, the, the well, now and, Dr. Fauci. And as we've talked about before, you can only hold a shelter in place yes, so long, and you're absolutely. starting to see some challenges in other states. Uh, I would just encourage all our Kansans, we are making progress, we are ahead on the scoreboard. Uh, let's not let go of this uh, uh, opportunity here uh, to beat this virus and to be successful by sometime this summer. And stick with it, stay home, wash your hands, do what makes sense. And wear your masks. Yeah, thank you very much. And, oh, excuse me. We do have a question. Oh, we have a question. We Good. do. Are presumptive positive cases being tracked in Arkansas? And what is that number? So the health department is tracking presumptive positives currently because the tests have loosened up a little bit. Uh, if, you're, if you're symptomatic and over age 65, or if you are in the contact tracing that the health department knows there was an individual okay. positive, that they are tracing you. Those individuals are being tested now, uh, and they are also tracking those that uh, have been negative, or been tested and are negative for the potential Good. for false negatives. Uh, so I think they are, those that they know about, they are tracing. There's a call center being set up at the College of Public Health to help the health department expand mm -hmm. capacity. 
Uh, you've heard on the news about the need to expand contact tracing so that you know, as we come back to work, as we loosen up these social things, when we do have a hot spot, we can actually wrap around it to try to have those people stay at home and not get back to the place that we are now. So, so yes, presumptive positives are being traced to the extent that the health department knows of them. But I think, again, this is out in our communities and many people are infected and are asymptomatic. That's why the, the masks in public places, that if you are one of those individuals that are infected and you just don't know it, you're not spreading it to other people. Terrific. Anything else? Oh, so that wraps up our week four. telecast, <laughs> week four. Thanks again for tuning in or, or uh, giving us a chance to share some of this information with you and we'll look forward to our, our uh, next outing. Thank you very much.